Well, welcome to the Victoria Rumble Room. A little show. That's right, a little show with a big heart, big heart, that looks at the big issues on Vancouver Island, BC, Canada, and the wide, wonderful world and universe. And universe. I'll add universe on. I am John Jurisic. And my usual partner in crime, Robin Adair, he's away this week. So I'd like to introduce our very special guest host, Paul Bearscale. Great to have you in the Rumble Room, Paul. You've helped us in the past. You helped us at the rally last week. And now you're on the big show. <laughs> Johnny, it's great to be here. Great to be on the Rumble Room, rumbling. Um, a little background. I've known Robin since the early 1970s, and we've stayed uh, close friends and comrades ever since specifically 1974. Woo-hoo. And uh, so uh, I've watched the progress of the Rumble Room with you and with Robin, and, and it's tremendous to see you guys involved in uh, local, provincial, and uh, uh, you know federal things that are that are going on. And um, as usual, there's lots of issues. We're going to talk about the doctors of BC. But I have to say, John, at the rally last week, um, I attended. I shot a bunch of video for the Rumble Room, which was great. But um, you did an exceptional job uh, hosting the event. And uh, what a turnout they had. It, w- it was fantastic. Uh, thank you for those kind words. Well, you know, it, it, it was an event made for a promoter and, and, and therefore made for me. Uh, it was, uh, we needed to make some noise. We needed to have the legislatures, uh, uh, legislators hear the voice of the doctors and the attendees at the rally. And, um, and of course, highlight uh, BC Healthcare Matters and, and, and the goal and the grassroots advocacy uh, that, uh, that Camille Curry uh, has been uh, promoting and advocating for now several months. Um, You know, this is a big problem. A million British Columbians don't have a family doctor call and this just isn't right. It's not acceptable. Camille Curry and her organization delivered 42,000 petitions to the legislature (laughs) demanding that immediate action be taken to solve the doctor's shortage. We made as much noise as possible to try to deliver that message. There was no immediate reaction from government. Uh, Shirley Bond from the Liberal Party and Adam Olson from the Greens certainly had some things to say. If there's one thing we agree about, you deserve a family doctor. Everyone in British Columbia deserves a family doctor. But I want you to know that while we may not be in that building, we hear your voices. I also asked the question, why did it take so long to sit down and talk with the professionals about this problem? When I got elected in 2017, this was one of the key issues in my riding and one of the key issues in the region and one of the key issues in this province. We knew that this was going to grow into an even bigger problem to the problem that we have today. I heard her being interviewed this morning um, on the radio and she mentioned that she had spoken to um, opposition members of the legislature, Uh, spoke obviously to Adam Olson, but. She's yet to get a direct direct, uh, meeting with the sitting government or any of the members in cabinet. What what is up with that? Okay. Anyway, that project continues, that project, that advocacy, Camille, that train continues to plow ahead, uh, demanding action to to solve the doctor shortage in BC. Um, And I had a chance to catch up with Camille once the rally event was over, and here's what she had to say. Well, welcome, Camille. Uh, day after the big rally at the legislature, oh my gosh, what an amazing event. I, I just want to thank you uh, for all of your work putting together the doctor's rally. Uh, yesterday, as we as this pod, as this vodcast starts to time itself 
That was May 19th. <laughs> and uh, you had your rally. You delivered the petition, a petition with almost 42,000 signatures and uh, calling for something to be done about the one in five people going without a family doctor. Do you think that we were heard yesterday? Well, I think if you were there yesterday, you couldn't imagine that anybody in the vicinity didn't hear us. So that was amazing. Um, but I think we also saw all major media outlets pick this up and run stories on it. Um, so we were heard by the media for sure. We had the Liberal Party and the Green Party in attendance. So we know they heard us too. And I honestly can't imagine that the NDPs didn't hear us um, inside. But, you know, what will really matter is their response to us after having heard us. It was, uh, it was very telling that at numerous points during the rally, especially when the politicians were talking, they were referencing the museum, which is 100 meters away from the legislature. There are all kinds of letters to the editor, uh, messages on social media, wondering why the province intends to spend nearly a billion dollars on a new Royal BC Museum and not on doctors and not on health care. So I know how I'm going to answer this, and I think I know how you are, but for our listeners and viewers, is there enough taxpayer money for both issues? I think that's a really great question, John. And I think that leads directly back to our demands for more transparency from this government. You know, to suggest that this is a reasonable place to spend $1 billion right now really demonstrates to me a further disconnect between this government and its residents' needs and also our calls for action. Um, I think it also suggests that when the funding for something is deemed necessary by the government, then they'll find the money to support the need. But right now, I don't agree with where they've declared the need to be, that's for sure. So Camille, all things considered, uh... Looking forward now, what are where does BC Healthcare Matters go? What what are the actionable items that really this movement can build upon and work upon and look forward to in the future? Yeah, so I think you know everybody has seen now what we've been capable of up to this point, and they can definitely count on us to continue with those type of um, calls to action. But and then some. So we want to keep up our um, registrations. We want to ask people to continue to go to our website and to register to stay um, in contact with us and to receive our newsletter. We want to also ask people to keep coming back to our Facebook page and our website to stay informed about any new calls to action or events that we have planned. Um, on our website, we also have a link for templates to help you write letters to your MLA. So we encourage people to continue doing that because it's important. It's important to keep reminding them that this issue is not going away. We're still here. The problem's still here. We want to demand transparency and immediate action from them. So you guys out there need to help us keep that pressure on all those MLAs. Um, we also hope to continue distributing out our lawn signs and even getting them out to more locations within British Columbia. So um, hopefully you'll start seeing them everywhere on the island and everywhere on the mainland. Uh, we also want to ask people to keep sharing your stories. It's really important for us for you to share your stories, whether it's on our Facebook page, through our contact us page, or even through our anonymous um, tips page, because we want to understand what citizens are continuing to go through. And then we'll use that messaging as well to continue to reinforce with the government that um, this isn't just about what the doctors want to need. This is about what your citizens are in need of um, and that we need action. And lastly, we're going to um, post about more volunteer opportunities that'll be coming up. So we, we're going to look to continue to expand our team and to be able to do that, we need more people to join us. So we'll um, put up some posts on our website and on our Facebook page that'll help just kind of identify what kind of roles that we're looking to um, fill. And hopefully others will see that as an opportunity to join us and to join this incredible movement. Wow. That, that, was, that was a great rally, and I just so much appreciated you being there, Paul, and, and capturing um, some uh, video evidence of, of, of what was an important advocacy moment in BC. You know, someone else who supports the call for more doctors is the mayor of Colwood, Rob Martin. He told us la last weekend that he supports the province declaring the doctor shortage a state of emergency. 
Rob had a lot of other things to say as well about regional policing. Oh my gosh, that's uh, uh, looming its ugly head all the time. And of course, rapid development in the West Shore. He spoke to Robin Adair. I kind of forget who Robin Adair is already. <laughs> oh, yeah. Who's he? No. Right? <laughs> and myself earlier. So let's zoom him in. Well, now, joining us in the Victoria Rumble Room, perhaps we should today call it the Victoria Rumble Room slash West Shore Rumble Room. Uh, for the first time this year is uh, Colwood Mayor Rob Martin. Great to have you here, Rob. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you guys today. Thanks for having me. Oh, fantastic. You know, there's always a lot to talk about, but it does start to summarize itself into two to three key issues. So let's start with the one that's really heating up the airwaves these days, the idea of a provincial police force to replace the RCMP. An all-party committee at the uh, legislature tabled this idea. Uh, Colwood has had the RCMP for a very long time, do you think it's time for a provincial police and more regional policing? Well, uh, so first of all, first of all, uh, and I have actually put out uh, uh, a Facebook and a Twitter uh, post on this as well. Um, I very much believe in regional policing, uh, and I and I think that that's really smart. But I also think that we're already doing it at West Shore uh, West Shore Detachment. We've got five. Uh, communities that we use. So it, it, it includes Langford, Colwood, uh, View Royal, uh, Highlands, The Chosen, and then our First Nations uh, communities as well. And I have to say, our RCMP has been second to none. Uh, I have been thrilled uh, with the service that we've received from uh, Superintendent Preston and his officers. Uh, and I wouldn't be supportive of looking at a provincial police force to substitute what I have with the RCMP. You know, and, and, and let me say this, this is one of the things that I'm really proud about with the RCMP, is if you ever talk about uh, who and what Canada is outside of Canada, one of the first things people point to is the RCMP, they point to the Red Surge. It is something that we take pride in as all Canadians. Um, and it, it would seem disingenuous of me to suggest that I think we need to have a provincial force to substitute that, I think the the uh, the, men, the men and women who serve uh, us through the RCMP have done a fantastic job, and and I wouldn't want to see that change. So, as a follow up, thank you. That's a that, thank you for that answer. There's been concern and expression from some uh, regional politicians that gang activity is growing on the West Shore, um, migrating out from downtown. So your response to that, and also would a regional police force improve the situation? From a gang standpoint, yeah. And we've seen, we've seen crime continue to rise on the West Shore. And, and I think that's natural as we see our populations increase. Um, that, that's, going to, that's going to be on top of that. And then you're going to see, hopefully, uh, our RCMP doing their jobs. And, and speaking within a region, like, I, I guess, you know, when I, when I think of our policing, especially here in the core, um, you know, Victoria, Saanich, uh, the West Shore RCMP, the Sydney RCMP, they're already working coordinated, the, coordinatingly together. Um, I don't see these silos uh, where, where the Saanich police are not talking to us or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm, I'm unfortunate because one of my counselors uh, that sits on public council is Council Jean, uh, Dean Jansen. He's a sergeant with the Spanish police. And mm -hmm. so I hear behind the scenes of the communication that happens between his department and what's happening with our West Shore detachment. And so I think those messages are really strong. And, and we're working together to make sure that, that criminals can't just cross a line and then suddenly be safe. Uh, <laughs> And that, that doesn't happen. I, I really sincerely don't believe that that happens. But we also, but I do appreciate that you brought up that, that we, have, we are starting to see more organized crime and we're starting to see, you know, drugs have a lot of money behind them, uh, behind that. And so that, that comes back into your community. And so we need to stay on top of that. And that's why we need to continue to invest into our policing. And one of the things that you'll see in the West Shore uh, Mayor Young has been really vocal about that he's continuing to support officers and, and bringing on new officers. 
If you look at Calder's five-year uh, plan when it comes to the RCMP, we are adding officers every single year because we understand our growth rate is increasing as well. And so that we are continuing and will continue to invest into protective services. Our largest, um, our lift this year um, for, for Colwood was about four and a half percent. Majority of that lift was protective services. That mm -hmm. was us investing into police and investing into our fire departments. Um, so the, it's, it's, it's a priority. It's interesting, the West Shore and especially Colwood, we really have this value focused around family and, and making sure that we provide a community that, that families want to live in and want to feel safe in. And by doing that, we need to be investing into our, uh, our, our RCMP. And I think we do. Okay, so there are lots of topics, as John um, suggested at the beginning of the interview. And another big one, of course, is housing. There's so much housing taking root in Colwood. There's uh, Royal Bay where the houses are going up so quickly and that development is growing exponentially. But there are concerns I've heard from people on the West Shore that some of the infrastructure isn't keeping up. It's still a single lane road. The highway that goes all the way out to Machosan, single lane. There's that big parkway that comes out of Langford and heads down to Colwood and it stops at Latoria. It just stops. And then you've got a single lane road again. And it seems to me that uh, that is a challenge would you agree that in some cases, at least, development's getting a bit ahead of some of the infrastructure to support it? I wouldn't say it's getting ahead, no. But what I would say is that we absolutely need to be investing more into our uh, transportation modes and how we're moving people. So it, I'm so glad you, you brought this up because I, I, just yesterday, um, the City of Colwood, we had our transportation uh, committee meeting. And what we talked about was actually double laning the chosen road. So we're actually looking at uh, moving it from a single lane each way to a double lane each way. And then uh, basically as you move down the chosen road, we would be looking at once you get past Wishard, tiering that down to three lanes. Um, so it would basically be a single lane each way and then a turning lane so that we're not slowing traffic down. And then, and then as you move into Royal Bay. As well, if you look at VMP and Latoria, uh, Veterans Memorial Parkway and Latoria, we have a significant investment in a double roundabout that we're investing there. Um, and so that double roundabout is going to service not only Royal Bay and Royal Beach, but we have a significant development at Olympic View. Uh, and Olympic View, I think people need to understand, Olympic View is a very large development that's going to be coming out right now. Um, it, it, it encompasses, Olympic View Golf Course encompasses three municipalities. It encompasses Machosan, Langford, and Colwood. Uh, most of the golf course itself is in the chosen, but the land part that they are developing right now in Langford, they're looking at over a thousand uh, units. Uh, and in the Colwood side right now, they're approved for over 450. Um, and, and we're looking at two uh, sort of uh, medium density, sort of six level um, uh, buildings there as well. But so, and then as you go down Latoria, you're also going to see that the Happy Valley is growing out on the Lankford side as well. And so we understand all of that traffic is going to be sort of con consolidating. And that was part of the reason we understood that right now we could get away with a single lane and we probably could get away with a single lane roundabout for about 10 to 15 years, but we're trying to be proactive. And so we're saying, listen, if we're going to be investing into this, let's invest into it now and let's build that infrastructure so it supports tomorrow's needs versus just trying to address today's needs. Mm. Um. How can we not continue on without, you know, chatting about affordable housing? It's the core issue for families, for bit, for everybody. And how also can we not continue a conversation without somehow or another referencing Langford or Stu Young? So <laughs> Langford's solution to affordable housing is to go up and up and up and up. <laughs> Numerous towers up to 24 stories in height have been approved or even higher, maybe. Is this a Colwood affordable housing solution as well? Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, and, you know, it's sad uh, that I've had to drift away from talking about the word affordable and really just start using the word attainable. Um, and because, you know, <laughs> these products really are, uh, are, 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 it's tough. I, if I can just use a, a brief example for you, it, it, talking about in Royal Bay, um, 
we have a single family home that three years ago sold for 800,000. The exact same home last month sold for 1.6 million. So that is that. So, you know, how you, and that's the struggle that you have as a municipal government too, is that you begin this vision of trying to build affordable, right? And so we had a vision of Royal Bay that we wanted to build single family homes. And that price point was about $600,000. And we thought that's a great price point to bring families and to support that. And then what happens is even though you attempt to do that at the beginning, it becomes a desirable product and you see that escalation in price. And so the only way that we can continue to provide attainable housing for families is to begin to provide different types of products. So that can be duplexes, townhomes, um, and then really even as you get into like a four story building. And I think you're gonna start seeing that, especially in Royal Bay, that as we begin to build out Latoria South, I think there's gonna be a lot more pressure um, to looking at those types of products versus the single family home. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, again, this is sort of housing related. Certainly it folds into everything else we're talking about. David Eby, housing minister, has talked about being unhappy about how slow some municipalities, at least, are moving in terms of approving housing developments. And he's saying the province may need to step in take over the mechanism, cut out the municipalities and approve these buildings more rapidly so that they get built because we have such a huge housing shortage, not just low cost housing, but housing in general. Uh, do you think this is necessary? Is it necessary in Colwood? Is it necessary in the province? Uh, it's absolutely not necessary in Colwood. <laughs> However, I do understand why uh, Minister Eby is doing it. Um, and and it's, it's a real struggle from a politician standpoint, because what happens is, is as a community leader, you get elected onto a council and that council, uh, the, 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 excuse me, the residents who've elected you have an expectation that you're going to represent them. And so if you ever try and build something like a six story building anywhere within a community, the reaction you will normally get from the neighborhood is we love the idea, just not beside us. We don't want that. We want it somewhere else. And so what happens is when you go to a public hearing on anything around density, you will have a room full of people who don't support it because people don't come out to support projects. They come out to say, I'm not happy with that project. The project. And so what happens is the only voice you ever hear is we, we, we appreciate that you need to build density, but don't build it here. Find somewhere else within the community to build that density. And so what happens is if you don't have leaders sitting at your council table who have the vision for how you build your community out 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and if you are only building the community to support today's voter, you're not going to build anything because, because what you, the voice is what you're going to hear is don't build it. Don't build it here. And, and, and I can give you a, Example after example after example for the city of Colwood, where, where we have tried to build four, five, six story buildings, and the neighborhood comes out around it not supportive of that concept. And I'm not sure why. I really struggle with it at times because, you know, I, I jokingly say, when did we stop liking people? <laughs> because nobody seems to want to have, like, there's a, I, there's a real misperception, I believe, on number one, who and what a renter is. I think, I think for some reason, people believe that renters are negative and that they're not going to take care of the community and they, they don't contribute back to the community, which I don't buy into at all. I think, I think, you know, the products that we have right now have really priced so many people out of this market. And so if we don't provide rentals, where are we putting all these people that need homes? Johnny, that was um, some good points that the mayor raised there. Uh, one of the things that um, he didn't talk about was... Um, the West Shore is so fast growing. And um, if you look at the population growth in the Capital Regional District in the past few years, it's Langford, it's Colwood and Machosan and even Souk. And, um, you know, we need uh, people to be able to get around on the island. <laughs> and um, with the talk of, a, you know, the easements and the railroad that are here on Vancouver Island, wouldn't it be great if it also included a commuter train where people could park, hop the train in Langford and get to downtown Victoria. Those rail lines are there. Um, 
we just need a concerted effort from um, obviously the officials here, but the provincial, it's always the provincial and federal government. People have to come to the table, but um, you know, people continue to come to Vancouver Island. They continue to come to Victoria and um, our economy, there's a great economic argument for the rail, for the, the restored rail line. There's lots of great reasons, in addition to just the commuter line. Well, absolutely right. You know, uh, uh, the West Shore, that includes the municipalities that you referenced, is in many people's eyes becoming the new Surrey. You've been a Vancouver um, a resident for years. You saw how, <laughs> you know, if you can't get around in these cosmopolitan cities, of which Victoria is emerging, to being one, you're stuck, man, you are stuck. And so the Island Corridor Foundation, that's a group that uh, is actually trying to solve this with a, a rail-based solution, has just released a detailed business case to upgrade the entire 290 kilometer system. Foundation Chair Larry Stevenson says the restored line will cost 431 million bucks and the detailed plan has now been delivered to the provincial and federal governments. You know what? To learn more, let's zoom in Larry Stevenson. Now joining us in the Victoria Rumble Room uh, for the first time this year is actually Larry Stevenson, the CEO of the Island Corridor Foundation. Uh, Larry, great to have you back on the program. Hey guys, great to be here. Good to see you both. And, and uh, last time, uh, you presented a pretty compelling case for the return of the ENN Railway to Vancouver Island. It would include, in, at least in initial plans that you talked about, uh, a commuter rail service from the Western communities into downtown Victoria. And now you say you have a business plan that can be a game changer. Why? Well, I mean, it, what, the, what the business case does is it really kind of formalizes all the thoughts around the things that we've been talking about for a very long time. And you know, you mentioned the service delivery. Well, the business case outlines a service delivery that does have interregional trains. They're going to operate twice a day from Courtney to Victoria. They're not going to run in the wrong direction at the wrong time, as apparently they did in the past. Uh, it's going to have a it's going to have a commuter system that will operate in the Langford Victoria corridor during peak hours. You know, at least to start. Uh, it's also going to offer freight service. That's going to you know it's going to it's going to really focus its efforts on the ports, but it's going to be all over the island. And then of course we'll have excursion trains. So. It's all outlined in the business case, uh, and we're excited to be presenting it because it's really kind of the first step in, in making this kind of official with the government. The total cost, when you look at it, it's about $380 million for construction and another $50 million for equipment. And that's a little higher than what we've talked about in the past. I think when I was here last time, we were talking about 350 or 360 million. But of course, inflation has come in. Is the revenue projection there? Uh, will, will, is it going to be affordable for people to jump on this train? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think one of the things that is unique about this particular system versus others that you see is we do have four very different types of operations that we're mixing into the revenue here. You know, if you look at how the business case is laid out, the revenue that's generated in the busiest part of the system, which is Langford, is probably lower than the rest of the revenue on the rest of the island. You know, the freight service, you know, it, it provides a huge opportunity for us to make this not just a break-even proposition, but a profitable one. I think that's easily attainable over the next few years. So, yeah, it's, it's very affordable. It's affordable. And yet, you know, people always are measuring, do we need a train again? People like mm -hmm. to drive their cars. There's other talks of other forms of rapid transit with uh, even, a, even a ferry that's been fostered mm -hmm. by Colwood that would go across the harbor. And people say, is, it, is the expense worth all of this effort uh, in a day and age where we have sky high gas prices and we have no doctors and we have all these other problems in the world? Is there really money for an ENN railway? Well, certainly, I think you, you have to look at this on a long-term basis. I would make the argument that we need it today. And, you know, when you look at the things that have happened to us, I think the last time I was on your program, we were right around the time of the, the big weather event, you know, where the Malahat was blocked for a number of days. We couldn't get people in and out. We couldn't move goods in and out. I think that was a bit of a wake-up call. It was a wake-up call for us. It was a wake-up call for the province. You know, I think they openly have admitted that there's not a lot of options available. The train brings that. You know, then when you start looking at things like the government's own studies are saying that it's, it's going to take two and a half hours to get from Mill Bay to Victoria by 2038. That's it. That should be a very scary proposition for all of us. You know, 
any of us that travel up and down the island highway, you know, we're, we're limited to that highway. Traveling through Duncan on a Thursday night, like, oh my goodness, you know, yeah, it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's getting worse all over the island. And, you know, the growth rates that we have out there, they're not going to slow down any. When you start looking at things like um, 41% of the greenhouse gases on, on, in BC come from road transportation, you know, we need to start taking steps and we need to start doing things today to make sure that we're here for tomorrow. There's another big issue, um, mm -hmm. one that's impacting all sorts of mega projects these days in our region, that being the uh, potential disputed lands where the rails sure. operate. There are First Nation lands claims. Uh, you've talked about First Nation support for this project. What has to happen with the Indigenous community to make this project possible? Well, I think if you if you look through the business case, there's a there's a piece in there that talks a bit about the history and you know the, the impact it's had on our First Nations peoples. You know, it, there is a history here that goes back to 1884 that you know was the original E and N land grant um, that took a 20 mile swath of property all the way up the island from Victoria to to Campbell River, um, and that land was taken. And you know the nations have for many years, you know, going back to the the 40s and 50s have been trying to resolve the issue that, hey, that land grant resulted in them losing some of their territorial land. That has to be dealt with. And, you know, it's our view that that has to be dealt with as a prerequisite of getting this railroad up and running. I mean, today, that land grant exists, you know, at least in, in terms of the corridor, it's 100 miles wide. It goes mm -hmm. from Victoria all the way to, to Courtney. Mm -hmm. It was 20 miles when it was taken. So it has to be dealt with. And, you know, our partners you know, they've made that very clear that this is this is kind of the, the, the thing that we're going to have to address. And, you know, we're fully supportive of that. Now, you've uh, mentioned that uh, federal and provincial officials that you've dealt with, uh, they were unwilling to move forward much without a business plan. Now you have a business plan. Uh, are you expecting any kind of a speedy response? And if you're a betting man, are you betting this is really going to push this project forward and we'll actually see it happen? Well, I think there's going to be a couple of things. You know, I don't think that this is necessarily the button that gets pushed that makes it all happen. What it does do, though, is it gives us a point of commonality from which we can start those discussions with the provincial government, with the federal government. It's a lot of money. It's $431 million. And somebody has to come to the table with that money. So does that push it? I don't think so. You know, the fact that we now have a timeline in front of us that was given to us by a court that says that by March of next year, we have to make a decision. Um, mm -hmm. I think those conversations are going to have to happen and they're going to have to happen now. Oh, Johnny, before we wrap up, I just wanted to talk about, um, you know, some of the larger issues of what's happened in downtown Victoria. We noticed that the crime rate was going down a little bit, but now we notice that it's going up again. Uh, mm -hmm. This is with, I think the young people have been gathering downtown and uh, they've been copying behaviors that they see from, you know, from other rallies. And also I live in James Bay, right near Beacon Hill Park. Yep. And um, if you go back two years ago and one year ago, you saw what happened with campers in Beacon Hill Park. I only live a block away from the park. And, you know, this could be happening again on Pandora Avenue. And uh, what happens is, you know, the homeless need help, but the problem, the situation can get out of hand so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, two years ago and one year ago, the campers in Beacon Hill Park, they had bicycle chop shops. They were dealing drugs and people stopped going to the park. And I, when I think about it, the elderly people, obviously who are here in Victoria, they were afraid to go into Beacon Hill Park. And uh, so we're keeping an eye on that. So kudos to the city. I think they're monitoring the situation pretty good. But we see the situation, these things can change very quickly. Tents are popping up on Pandora Avenue, uh, kind of as it was three years ago, if you think. There were tents outside City Hall, now on Pandora Avenue. So, um, you know, that situation has to be monitored, monitored. The other thing that we noticed, and I guess this has been going on for a long time, along Douglas Street right near the park, we notice a lot of... Um, RVs and uh, boondockers. They'll come and stay for seven to 10 days and then they leave. You know, they're not going, and I could see this, they're not going to an RV park. They're not paying any rental fees. So what do they do? They come down to Beacon Hill Park. Sometimes they're tourists from across Canada and we love 
to see the tourists back in our fair city. But um, it just takes, uh, you know, a few extras to go over the line. And before you know it, you have a situation that can, can get out of control, John. Paul, outstanding observations. And, and as, you know, crime and safety in downtown Victoria and its sort of peripheral neighborhoods is becoming increasingly a problem. It doesn't seem to be solving itself with any kind of uh, policy direction from City Hall. I would love to hear updates from you as you live there uh, as we get closer to the election in November. But, you know, for today, that's about it for you and I. Uh, and man, have I enjoyed co-hosting with you. What are we going to do if we enjoy this more than Robin Adair? <laughs> well, maybe I can be a, a, an ongoing correspondent and uh, and uh, you know, report from James Bay and, and give you an update from another part of the city. Oh, man, that's going to be so fun. And boy, is it great to tease Robin. Um, but anyway, thank you very much. And, uh, and, and thanks for, for, uh, thanks for your commentary. Thanks for your help at the rally. Uh, for those folks that want to continue to watch the John and Paul show, uh, please remember to uh, watch us, uh, watch the rumble room on, uh, on Facebook, on uh, Twitter, uh, certainly on YouTube. Uh, we have a news group that uh, allows others to uh, contribute and, and post their opinions. That's uh, Victoria Rumble Room News and Views. We have an Instagram page. We have a TikTok page. And, uh, and just uh, as an aside to, to, um, to stop our teasing, Robin Adair will be back next week. He will be well rested. And Paul, this is where you get to say, see ya. <clears throat> Johnny, it's been great being on the Rumble Room. And uh, to Robin and to yourself, thank you for the invitation, for letting me co-host and rumble on. Absolutely. We're going to see a whole lot more of you, Paul. I am John Jurisic. I'm referred in many different ways, often the creation sensation, sometimes the mayor of North Tulip, but now the promoter at the ledge of the BC doctor's uh, shortage. Rumble on. <laughs>